Um, so, uh, a couple of um, things just to mention. Um, remember that there are questions from last week's lab that are due tomorrow in lab. Um, obviously, let me know if you have uh, any questions about that. Um, and um, I'm still working out my plan for um, lab tomorrow. I feel uh, on, a, on a stress level I, where I was at a 70 on a scale of 1 to 10, I'm now at like an 8. So, I mean, it's better. <laughs> um, so, it's getting better. We are going to continue talking about aspects of um, innate immunity and inflammation, um, similar to what we were talking about last time um, when I decided to have a geek out session at the end of class. Um, I will also point out that. Um, we had a little bit of that discussion at the end of class um, where we were talking about damps. Um, and I told you that damps were sort of controversial. Um, I have very strong recollections of this conversation I had with one of my professors in grad school about this. Um, and so I actually emailed him yesterday um, because I have been doing research on PRRs sort of ever since that time. And so I know what the PRR people think about damps, but I figured I would ask someone who is like doing immunology research a little bit farther away. And he definitely told me 10 years ago that damps did not exist. And so I wrote him an email last night, and he's like, oh, yeah, damps are totally real. I never said they didn't exist. And I'm like, <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, you did. Okay. Um, so that's the answer to that. So apparently, apparently we're good with them now. <laughs> that is what I learned from my emailing. Um, last time we talked through the specific details of the processes you see on the slide here. Um, there are two places where we're going to extend that discussion today. Um, the first place that we're really going to extend that discussion um, has to do with um, the microbes that we're looking at. Um, so as is, here you see a bacteria leading to infection um, at the site after tissue damage. And everything that we talked through last time with this process is sort of classically thought of as a response to bacterial infection. Um, you do see sometimes that response with other types of pathogens, but classically this is sort of a bacteria response. Um, and so I want to talk a little bit about the process when we have a different type of pathogen, specifically a virus. So I'm going to talk through this process, sort of the classical way this process works for viruses. Um, and then we're going to zoom in a little bit on the receptors, the PRRs, um, and sort of specific details about those receptors. Um, so in talking about um, aspects of the viral recognition and response process, there are a couple of things that I want to remind you about in terms of viral infection and a viral infectious cycle. Um, so I'm going to go through this sort of big picture just so that I can refer back to a couple points as we're going today. Um, so typically, a virus will a virus cell and will interact with some receptor on the cell surface to allow it into the cell. And a lot of the early events in viral infection have to do with getting the genome loose. So there's a whole bunch of proteins and things around the genome as like packaging, and we gotta get the genome out. And so there are sometimes a lot of steps, sometimes sort of one magic-y step, um, allows that genome out. Once it's out, um, we see things like transcription, replication, all that kind of good stuff going on with um, enzymes either that the virus is bringing or using host cell enzymes. Um, eventually, 
we're going to see translation um, of viral proteins. That always happens using the host ribosome. Um, so no, whether or not we're bringing in transcription and replication, we always use the host cell ribosome. Usually it's almost like a takeover, like we're like, yeah, we don't need to translate any host proteins, we're just gonna use these ribosomes and make virus proteins. Um, a bunch of virus proteins, and those proteins will go into a new virus particle that will be released along with the genome. Um, two things to sort of point out about that. One of them, if you, if I zoom in on this uh, virus here, um, you see guy, <laughs> this blue thing around. But if you were to really zoom in on that blue thing, it's many copies of one protein over and over and over again. So you'll have one virus protein that comes together in like hundreds or thousands of copies of just that one protein that was made over and over to make the virus uh, capsid. Um, here they all look like little triangles. And the, it's basically just multiple copies of that same triangle protein. Um, but the, so that will be important uh, a little bit later. The other thing to notice here is that if we try to think about targets for um, our PRRs, there aren't a lot of choices. We basically are using host ribosomes, maybe using host polymerases. Um, we're using a fair number of host enzymes, and so there aren't a lot of good targets. Um, many of the targets end up being nucleic acid. Um, and that will, again, come to be important a little bit later today. Um, and so, in fact, when we, when we think about virology, thinking about nucleic acid ends up being super important. Um, so in the bacterial um, inflammation process I told you about, we saw some inflammatory cytokines. Those cytokines were things like IL-1 beta, TNF alpha, and IL-6. When we see the uh, process happening with viruses, um, in the end, the big, one of the big differences is the cytokine that is produced. The main cytokine that we think about when we think about viral infections is a cytokine known as interferon. Um, Interferon was first described in 1957, um, where um, these researchers were putting stuff that came from cells <laughs> onto flu-infected cells and realized that the stuff would interfere with infection. So they called it interferon. <laughs> um, and we now know that this stuff that interferes with infection is a cytokine that is being produced by the infected cell. Um, there are really multiple types of interferon. There are type one, type two, and type three. Um, today, when I say interferon, I really mean type one interferon. And type one interferon is interferon alpha or interferon beta. Um, Interferon alpha and beta are the first to be made after infection. Um, they're made within hours, and in fact, they are starting to go away in some cases by 10 hours after infection. Um, there are two other types, type two and type three. Um, type two is called interferon gamma. It's important in the adaptive immune system. We will care later. Um, the other one is type three, um, largely interferon lambda. Um, it has been described much more recently. There's actually not as much known about interferon lambda, but you might see something about type three interferon. Really today, we're, we care about type one interferon. Those are the ones, that, that's the one that's important in the innate immune response. Um, what you can notice about interferon alpha and interferon beta from this table is that they are both produced by basically all nucleated cells. So if a cell has a nucleus, it generally can produce interferon, and it will produce that interferon in response to viral infection. 
um, we are going to hear sort of this idea of all nucleated cells do this, all nucleated cells do that, a few times throughout the semester. Um, when I say all nucleated cells, what am I really referring to in terms of the body? Or are there any cells that aren't nucleated? Yeah. Huh? So, and so the things that are, so like skin doesn't have a nucleus? Is that what you're saying? Not quite. <laughs> so, what were you going to say, Mark? Yeah, so the only cells that don't have nuclei are red blood cells. So this bit, so when I say all, all nucleated cells, I mean everything but red blood cells. And why do you think whether a cell is nucleated or not makes a difference for viral infection? Yeah, Lexi. Well, so the ribosomes are... <laughs> okay, yeah, Vanessa. So the virus often uses some of the cell's enzymes for replicating nucleic acid. The enzymes are in the nucleus. So if a cell doesn't have a nucleus, then it's kind of useless for the concerned. The virus can't use it. And so uh, the lack of a blood cells sort of makes them a little different in terms of viral infection. So from time to time, we'll talk about, well, all nucleated cells do this. That really means they're the ones that viruses care about. So, and AKA everything but red blood cells. Doesn't mean other parasites like the ones you saw in malaria don't care about red blood cells. They're fine with red blood cells. But viruses, red blood cells are kind of useless. Um, so um, we need to talk a little bit about what's going on with interferon. Um, what happens, first of all, is that our cell will become infected um, by a virus. Typically, what will happen is that that cell will become a virus production factory and will make lots more copies of that virus. Really isn't a good way to virus a cell. You can't sort of pick out the bad RNAs and leave the good ones alone. Um, most cells that are infected with a virus are kind of goners. Um, there's not much you can do for them. Um, unless you that process really, 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 really early. Um, however, that cell that is infected can produce this, cytokine, this type 1 interferon cytokine. That process will happen because there was a pattern recognition receptor that bound something from the virus and led to some signaling so that the cell made type 1 interferon, just like we saw to make some other inflammatory cytokines last time. And that type 1 interferon will bind to an interferon receptor. Um, that interferon receptor will be on a neighboring cell that is uninfected. And this will alter the activities of this neighboring uninfected cell. So that this neighboring uninfected cell will be in what is known as the antiviral state. That will allow this cell to block infection if a virus starts to infect that cell. So now that this cell is ready to do things super early to stop itself from becoming a virus production factory. And so the original infected cell makes interferon, but it's also going to not live. However, before it dies, it sends out a message to its friends in the form of interferon to tell them to get ready to protect themselves from this process. Um, you can, yeah, Olivia. Um, there is, are some things related to that and vaccines and how it works. Um, I will come back to that in a slide a little bit later because there's a, there's a point I can tie that to um, that comes up. Yep. Yeah. So the pale looking ghost virus thing in that last cell is the virus that's been inhibited somewhere early in its uh, infection. Um, so this is a little bit more information about the antiviral state. 
So the first thing that I want you to see is we have a cell over here. It's on one side of this big black line. I, try, I tried to turn this into two cells by making a black line. So there's cell number one and cell number two. We got cell number one. It gets infected by a virus. Stuff happens. The stuff is the later part of this lecture. <laughs> right now, we don't care about the stuff. Eventually, this cell makes interferon, type 1 interferon, interferon alpha and beta. And that binds to the interferon receptor ring cell. That is going to lead to um, and changes in that neighboring cell. The, interfer the type 1 interferon is going to bind to the interferon receptor. And it is going to lead to um, transcription of a bunch of genes. Um, we don't, there isn't sort of a specific answer I can give you. There are a whole long list, like of a thousand genes, that it could be. And what people really love to study now is like with flu, it's this set of 58. And with Ebola, it's this set of 63. And so, like, at each virus leads to some subset of these. Um, genes, and that's one thing that kind of people spend some time working out. Um, these genes as a group are known as interferon stimulated genes, or ISG, because they are made when you stimulate with interferon. So you put interferon on a cell, you get an ISG, an interferon stimulated gene. Yeah, Mark? You and I can, t I can talk, tell you a little bit about it um, at some point, but there, there, I am certain um, from my previous interactions with you that it will not be as much information as you would like to know. <laughs> um, and that is really something that people are still starting to, now that people can do kind of larger scale experiments where they can look at, say, a thousand genes instead of like one or two, starting to really work out those profiles. Um, most of these interferon stimulated genes have um, in common the same promoter. So there is a promoter called the ISRE. Um, it's the interferon stimulated response element. So when you stimulate cells with interferon, it's the thing that responds. Um, so most ISGs have the ISRE in front of them as their promoter. Um, the combination of which ISGs are made um, is probably really important in protecting against each particular viral infection. Though obviously, um, as I implied in answering Mark's question, there's a lot that we don't know about how that specific combination occurs. Um, and then we can think a little bit about sort of mechanism here. Um, how is it that these proteins that are encoded by these genes actually allow the cell to be antiviral? How do they make this magic cannot be infected state for the cell? Um, one thing I will tell you is that each one probably has its own mechanism. So I could now list a thousand mechanisms for you. That sounds fascinating. Um, or I'm going to tell you about some really famous ones. Um, clearly, these are not the only ones that are out there, but I'm just going to mention a few uh, particularly important ones that I know a lot about. Um, so this is a figure from your textbook of a view of the antiviral state. Results of interferon binding to the interferon receptor. And again, remember that this is happening in this neighboring uninfected cell. One of the things that can happen is that we can start transcribing and translating um, something called protein kinase R. Protein kinase R, um, surprising hopefully to no one, is a kinase. Um, and thus can phosphorylate things. 
It turns out it phosphorylates something called EIF2A, which is involved in translation. Um, and so this actually makes the cell stop translation. So if you think about it, how is it that stopping translation would be beneficial for this antiviral state? Yeah, Mark. Yeah, now, you're, now you can't make any of the virus's proteins. And so the virus is going to be sort of stopped in its tracks because we're not making any viral proteins. You can see another set of that are made over here on the side that also inhibit translation. There are some proteins like the MX proteins that seem to inhibit vi the virus's ability to assemble into that capsid. Um, Another one that's particularly famous is one called uh, 2 prime, 5 prime oligoasynthase, usually known as OAS among immunologists. Um, and OAS eventually turns on an RNase, which degrades mRNAs. Why is it that degrading mRNAs would be really combating a virus? Yeah, Mark. Right. So now you're basically making it so you can't, trans you can't even translate the viral proteins. Um, some viruses have RNA genomes, and so you're, get, you're tearing up the genome, you're making it so they can't do translation. All sorts of useful stuff. Um, I have a feeling I know what your question is. So I'm going to wait. And if it's not the question I think it is, then you can ask it in a second. <laughs> okay. Um, so I'm going to give you two other examples. Um, one that's kind of cool, um, which I learned about recently, um, is called ISG-15. ISG-15 actually um, is sort of like ubiquitin, which is involved in degradation of things. And um, when ISG-15 is made, it sits on the ribosome and just sticks around. Actually, there's a, another protein sits on the ribosome and sticks ISG-15. ISG-15 is like a little post-it note that it just sticks on 5% of all proteins out of the ribosome. Bing, 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 5%, just randomly. It's just sitting there as soon as they come off the ribosome. And that 5%, it's 5, 5 to 10%. 5% gets messed up and don't work. It turns out that like if 5% of your proteins get messed up, that's okay. But in that situation where you need to have a whole bunch of copies of one protein that if you mess up 5% of them, you can actually never get a stable structure. Um, and so the 5% loss of your proteins is like not that big a deal because it's going to completely ruin that whole stable structure. Once you get one capsid protein, you're done. Yeah, Mark? OK, and why don't we wait on that one too? Um, one other really interesting uh, of the many ISGs that exist is called SAMH. SAMHD1 um, actually breaks down DNTPs um, so that we no longer have those DNTPs. Here, um, that means why does that do something to the virus? Why is that a problem? Where, where in your life have you ever seen DNTPs before? Like what, any kind of experiment where you've ever had to use DNTPs? Yeah. Okay, but there's, there's well, all of what kind of experiments? PCR. When PCR, one of the ingredients you have to add is DNTPs. What are DNTPs? The nucleotides, the A's, the G's, the T's, the C's, make more DNA. So what does it mean that SAMHD1 is basically tearing them all up? So you're going to stop the ability for new DNA synthesis, stop the ability for nucleic acid. So again, we're going to stop the virus's ability to replicate our genome. 
So all of these are pretty great um, that we can see of ISGs. And like I said, there's a huge long list of ISGs. We could go on and on and on of different types of ISGs. There is also a huge problem here. And this is what I am anticipating uh, the question probably was. So what's, what, 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 did you see a problem? You can ask a question about Robert. Okay. Okay, so maybe, let's imagine that these, that there are like a hundred of these things knocking down the virus in different ways, and they're pretty effective. Okay, so that's one problem, but there's another big problem. Yeah, Mark. Doesn't most of this hurt your cell too? Why would it hurt your cell? Yeah, Nick. Yeah, we're stopping protein synthesis. We're stopping mRNAs. Your cell needs all of these processes. And we have just done things to stop all And, um, Uh, you'll be able to get from this slide, but so interferon is turning on the production of gene products that are really bad for our cells. And one way you could get around this is you could be like, well, that's okay. Very few cells, maybe, maybe not that many cells actually respond to interferon. Maybe interferon leaves most cells alone. Well, it turns out interferon can be made by any cell that can be infected by a virus can be infected by a virus? All the ones except the red blood cells? Um, because it needs to be listening to hear if its friends are infected. So any cell that can be infected with a virus should have an interferon receptor. So what, how many cells of your body can be influenced by interferon? All the cells of your body except for red blood cells. And so, in fact, you have this cytokine that's being produced by your cells that leads to a potentially bad effect in your cells, and every single cell is sensitive to it. It's not so great. If you have large quantities of interferons in your body, you feel like crap. And it's because this is not good for your cells. You might have a fever. You might have chills. You might have nausea. You might have malaise. They are all referred to together as flu-like symptoms. And in fact, every viral infection leads to that same set of symptoms. So whenever you have flu-like symptoms, that really means your immune system is responding to a virus. It does not necessarily mean you have the flu. Um, and that's why these symptoms can be so common. Olivia asked earlier about vaccines. Um, this is one place where I like to get very soapboxy, so that's how it goes. Um, when you get a vaccine, you are hoping that your body induces an immune response to the microbe. The first part of inducing that immune response is gonna to be to make some inflammatory cytokines. And so it's possible that that vaccine can lead you to feeling some of these things. It's not because the vaccine is really harming you or doing anything, it actually means that your immune system is doing a good job and is making the response it's supposed to be making in order to lead to protection. It's um, what happens is that when you become an immunologist, um, your friends get really annoyed at you, and also your uncle and your mom and a few other people, um, when they tell you how crappy they feel after they get a vaccine and you respond to them, I'm so happy to hear that your immune system is doing what it's supposed to do. Um, and yes, that has happened to me more than once. I always respond. People like are, none of my friends will even talk about this on Facebook anymore because they just know I'm going to write something ridiculous. Um, and so this is one reason why one of the previous points I told you about interferon is so important. These interferons are made rapidly, but then they are turned off rapidly. You want to have a quick burst where we block potential viral infection, but we don't want to have our cells inhibited for a long period of time. We see the type 1 interferons as part of the immune system 
quick burst early um, before being turned off. And that's one of the ways that we are able to deal with um, some of these problems. One other thing that I want to mention um, is that um, some of the things that we've been talking about interconnect with one another. It seems as though type 1 interferons, which are being responsible for the infection, can sometimes lead to inhibition of things like IL-1 beta, TNF, and IL-6. Is one reason most of the because in fact the flu has weakened their immune system so that they no longer are responding to bacteria. The interferon has inhibited um, the antibacterial response that we've talked about. Um, and so this is sort of another problem with interferon is sometimes you do see a little bit of immunosuppression um, of some of the other pathways. Yep, Robert. So only a very small number of viruses integrate. Um, that's actually a serious minority of viruses that integrate. So most of them, once you degrade, if you, you know, degrade at early steps, it's gone. Um, one other thing I will point out is within the past week, um, so many of these cytokines that we've been talking about and um, will continue to be talking about um, tend to be things that go wrong in certain types of autoimmune or inflammatory diseases. Interferon is no uh, exception. Um, interferon, for example, is often seen at high levels in patients with lupus. Um, within the past week, there has been a new drug that inhibits interferon that has had amazing effects in clinical trials of lupus. Um, and so these are sort of some of the targets that people are looking at. Um, we talked about uh, TNF and IL-1 a little bit last time. There are drugs that inhibit both TNF and IL-1 that are used in a lot of patients um, to great effect. Um, and in fact, all of these processes, um, be they the process that we talked about last time um, that we saw was sort of the classic bacterial infection, be they this interferon process with viruses, are involved in a lot of clinical conditions. Um, and as a result, understanding how the cell knows to make these cytokines and sort of the specific details of that process have become really important. Um, and that has helped, has sort of been why we need to learn about the specific details of PRRs and how they work. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit in a, in a slide in a second about some of the really first well-described ones that kind of kicked off the field of PRR biology. Um, the talking about now, but experiments related to that protein, um, in fact, won the Nobel Prize for Medicine in 2011. There is so much obvious potential for understanding PRR biology um, in terms of uh, intervention in medicine. Um, and so we can divide up all of the PRRs that are out there into some groups. Um, and your textbook has this nice table that lists all of these groups. Um, they vary based on things like the location in the cell where they are looking for ligand, the specific ligands that they look for, and then what happens to the what happens downstream signaling. I'm going to mention, um, actually no, this person did win that Nobel Prize. There were three people in that prize. Um, there, uh, this gene actually has won two Nobel Prizes. Um, the first one won a Nobel Prize was for developmental biology. Um, so there were people who were trying to study aspects of developmental biology. They were making mutations in flies, in Drosophila and looking at how the embryos develop differently. And um, does anybody here know Dermin? You know? OK. All right. So the person who was doing these experiments is, uh, was a German woman named Christi Christiane nilsine volhart And she was making mutations and then looking at her embryos to see if 
or anything. And with one of them, she looked in the microscope. Sort of different um, interpretations of it. So people will talk oh shit, like, <laughs> I've heard a lot of different things, but that's the thing is that she looked, she saw these embryos that were super messed up in development, and she said tall. And so in the end, the G got tall. <laughs> um, people eventually figured out ways to make adult flies that were missing toll. So they were, um, they developed normally, but then they were adults that didn't have this protein. And when they did that, they found something crazy. And this is actually one of those flies. Um, this is a pretty famous image to a lot of immunologists. This was on the cover of a journal. And so like this cover sort of was in everybody's mind for a long time. This, all this green stuff that is shown here is fungus growing all over this fly. This fly is completely colonized with uh, fungal hyphae. And so it was realized that the same gene, toll, seemed to have some effect in immunity in this fly. Um, a group of other papers, people found that there were proteins that were very similar, basically orthologs in mammals, and they were named the toll-like receptors. Um, and so the first big class of PRRs that was really discovered and known, that people started to think a lot about, were the whole like receptors or TLRs. Yep. Yes. Um, you can see the structure of a toll like receptor on the right hand side here. Um, they all have um, a extracellular exterior domain that can. Um, regions called leucine-rich repeats, um, as well as a domain for signaling called the tear domain. Um, for a long time, people had a really hard time doing biochemistry with toll-like receptors because it turns out that the leucine-rich repeat is crazy sticky. Um, and so they couldn't do a lot of experiments they wanted to do. Um, and so for a long time, we called them sensors and not receptors because no one could do a biochemical experiment where they could show it binding to ligand. Um, and so we were like, it's the sensor, but we don't know if it physically binds. Um, in many cases, the physical binding has now been shown. Um, and that binding seems to happen at the leucine-rich repeat. Um, we know of a whole bunch of toll receptors in humans. So again, this is a table from your textbook listen it, listing um, toll-like receptors 1 through 13. You will notice that they each have somewhat different ligands, but they are all nice microbe-associated molecular patterns like LPS or flagellin um, or things like that. Um, and so we've got a huge list of toll-like receptors. Those toll-like receptors can be divided into two groups. Two groups of toll-like receptors are the group that live on the planet, group that live in and some receptors that are looking for things inside of uh, compartments. Look at all of those uh, toll-like receptors that are on the surface of the membrane. And for each of them, you see listed um, the type of microbe that is detected. And so you'll notice bacteria, 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 bacteria across any of these. Um, so these TLRs that are at the cell surface lead to a common type of signaling. And that common type of signaling 
always leads them to making one special transcription factor. That transcription factor is called NF kappa B. Um, for some reason, students really want it to be NF kappa beta, but it's actually NF kappa B. That's less fun. And so the ones on the are generally detecting bacteria, and they lead to NF kappa B signaling. When you turn on NF kappa B, oh look! transcription factor and tell the cell to make the And thus we make that inflammatory response you saw last time as well as stimulating an adaptive immune response. And so this all kind of comes together full circle where the type of microbe um, is sensed by which PRR is binding it and that ends up leading to an appropriate type of immune response. Alternatively, when we look at the TLRs that are found in the exome, you will, can look at what they are, and you will notice virus, 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 virus. <laughs> from some virus. And as a result, it should make sense to you that they are going to lead to a different kind of signaling so that we can get that antiviral response that we talked about. They do that by leading to production uh, on the activation of a specific transcription factor called IRF. There's a whole bunch of IRFs. I don't care about the numbers right now. It's just IRF. IRF stands for interferon regulatory factor. And guess what interferon regulatory factor makes? Interferon. <laughs> Uh, and so endosomal TLRs don't lead to NF kappa B and this inflammatory cytokine profile. Instead, they lead to IRF that results in production and antiviral state. And so again, we can see sort of this appropriate response is being made for each type of uh, microbe that we might see. Yeah, Nick. Um, they are, and so I am very much oversimplifying that difference, and I'm very much giving you some classical stuff. There are absolutely, there are interferon responses to bacteria. Viruses are affected by some of those other cytokines. I'm just sort of simplifying right now. Um, these are one of our big groups of pattern recognition receptors. Um, if we look at the other group of recognition receptors, People started doing their naming and started thinking about them kind of based on a model of TLRs. And so what you will notice is people discovered TLRs and the other groups something LR. And so it's some letter LR. And so they tried to kind of parallel what they saw with TLRs. Um, one that and only briefly are the C-type lectin receptors or the CLRs. These CLRs bind to uh, fungal um, antigen, or fungal uh, patterns. And so we see uh, molecules from fungal cells being bound. Again, we get a slightly different type of signaling cascade, and we make a response that is appropriate for fungal infection now. Um, and so again, we're getting this nice match between the center senses a particular type of microbe, and that leads to a response that is appropriate. Um, the uh, CLRs, as you can see, are largely found on the plasma membrane, which is good because fungi fungal infections are usually outside of cells and not inside of cells. So it makes sense that you want a receptor looking outside of cells. Um, and that lead to a nice antifungal response. Um, the next one that I want to talk about are the RLRs. Um, two things I want you to see right here about the RLRs. First of all, the RLRs are in the cytosol. And second of all, they are specifically responding to viral RNA. 
if you were going to have a spoiler of, the R, of what I'm going to tell you on the next slide about RLRs, based on that, what transcription factor do you think RLRs lead to? What cytokines do you think they lead to? Yes, Mark? Interferon. Interferon. Why? Because they're viral. They're responding to viruses. So you hope they make IRF and interferon. Happily, they make IRF and interferon. <laughs> um, RLR, the RLR stands for the Rig I like receptor. Rig I was the first member of this family described. Um, and it's a pretty interesting protein viral RNAs. Um, it and many other um, proteins that signal like it actually sit on the mitochondria. It's like they use the mitochondria as a platform. Um, and so the idea of the mitochondria as a platform in immunology is super cool, and I could talk about that for days. Um, but I'm not going to right now. Um, but we have this whole group of um, proteins that actually bind to um, RNA. It gets a little complicated. Think about the naming of the next group. Are the NLRs. Um, you can see here that they are found in the cytoplasm. So PLR stood for toll like receptor. And RLR stood for rig eye like receptor. Um, we're going to have to do one called ALR later. It's going to stand for aim like receptor. So NLR kind of imagine what it's going to stand for. Um, it stands for nucleotide binding leucine rich repeat protein. <laughs> the story goes that the, there was an NLR that was described. Was the first NLR that was described was this one called NOD1. And so they called the rest of them the NOD-like receptors. And then they realized NOD was super weird and the rest of them were not like it at all. Um, and so then they kept NLR and like made a new words that they could try to make say NLR. Um, so they do all have a nucleotide binding domain. Um, they and they all have leucine rich uh, repeats. And so that's where the how they actually got the NLR uh, for this. Um, in total, these proteins have um, a particular structure. So you can see they've got three parts. One of them is this LRR. One of them is a nucleotide binding domain. And then they have this other domain. There are some that are called like NLRP, like NLRP1 or NLRP2 or NLRP3, et cetera. And the ones that have a P have a pyrin domain. There's ones that are called NLRC, NLRC1, NLRC2, NLRC3. They all have a card domain. There's ones that are called NLR, uh, they're actually, they just, don't really use those. There's even one that has a random thing, and it's called NLRX. It's called NLRX1. Um, the reason I show you this structure is that there are two other types of proteins that are important in biology that have the same kind of structure. The first is shown at the top, the NBS LRR proteins. Um, you can see the LRR is the same. You can see the NBD is the same. The only difference is they have a different additional domain. Those NBS LRR proteins are actually the pretty much the entire immune system of plants. And so it looks like this same structure has been used at a few different times in evolution um, for defense. We also have this other protein um, that doesn't have an LRR, but has something that looks kind of similar called the WD40 domain. As a card domain, and it is known as. You might not remember it, but you actually have learned about APAF1 before. Have you heard of APAF1? Since that is a prereq for that class, it's a good guess that that would be where you heard about it. Any, any more ideas of where in some way you heard about it? Yes. Go for it. Uh, it. Not really, no. So Dunaway told you about this group of proteins, and he called it the pinwheel of death. Yeah, a 
that's involved in apoptosis. APOP1 is one of the proteins in the apoptosis group that leads to apoptosis. It's officially an organelle that they call the apoptosome. So it's part of the apoptosome. That will be important in a second. Different NLR can lead to different um, signaling outcomes. And it varies a bit, kind of based on whatever this other domain is, among other things. Are wacky. Um, some of them bind to um, microbial tends to lead to production. So the first couple, nod one and nod two, lead especially to like the TNF, IL-1, IL-6, NF-kappa-B type of process. Um, but you can find NLRs that lead to either type of cytokines, depending on what NLR you're talking about. Is that a question? OK. Um, but some of the NLRs can do another kind of signaling as well. Those can bind to two other proteins, two other friends, and make a structure. The NLR is shown at the top, and the two other proteins, ASC and caspase 1, are shown here. And they make this structure looks kind of like a flower. And this is involved in inflammation. It's very much involved in making IL-1 beta. And so because it's, and if, if you look at it, does it look familiar at all? It looks like the apoptosome. It looks like the pinwheel of death. And so instead of being called the apoptosome, because that one was in apoptosis, this one's in, in inflammation. So it got called the inflammasome. And many NLRs all have the ability to um, lead to inflammasome action. Um, what will happen is uh, NLRs that will come together along with ASC, and that will bring all of these caspase 1 molecules together. Caspase 1 is an inactive protease. It's procaspase 1. But when you bring all of it together, Um, with caspase 1. Um, and so you are now together um, your NLR, ASC, and caspase 1. This activates caspase 1, and it can cleave a whole bunch of substrates. One of those substrates is actually the inactive form of IL-1 beta, so this is required for IL-1 beta secretion from cells. But there are lots of different types of um, proteins that can be cleaved. When you learned about caspases in Bio 250, you mostly learned about caspase 3, maybe a little caspase 7, maybe a little caspase 9. And they are involved in apoptosis. And students often think caspase equals apoptosis. It's not actually true. Some caspases are apoptotic caspases. Some do other things. Caspase 1. About the other things, I do have to go to apoptosis for a second. When you have learned before about apoptosis, what do you want apoptosis to be? Any special, anything special about it other than that? Yeah. It's usually referred to as programmed cell death. So the idea is that there's like cell die. It's not like the cell just randomly dies. There's multiple kinds of programmed cell death. There's multiple kinds of death that involve signaling. So Dono he teaches it to you in Bio 250. He teaches you apoptosis which is programmed, and necrosis, which is like random. But it turns out there's other options besides that. And I need to tell you about one of those other options. Um, 
Here you can see apoptosis on the left-hand side. When a cell undergoes apoptosis, it makes little fragments of its nucleus. It makes these nice little apoptotic bodies and sort of degrades. Basically, all of the toxic stuff in the cell gets wrapped up in a little package. Um, and the way I like to think about apoptosis is that apoptosis is quiet cell death. Apoptosis happens when you're developing to get rid of the webs between your fingers. When that happened, the cells that under apoptosis just sort of shriveled up and died really quietly, and they didn't disturb their neighbors at all, right? The form of cell death that we're going to talk about here is what different form of cell death. It is, um, so you talked with Dunaway about necrosis. And it's random. And you can imagine that's not very quiet. Well, it turns out that there is another form of cell death called uh, pyroptosis. Now, if you see pyro as a prefix, what does it make you think about this cell death? Fire. It, in fact, is fiery cell death. <laughs> and pyroptosis is programmed necrosis. It's the cell blowing up and releasing its contents and not wrapping them up and not being quiet about anything. That cell is dying, but it is letting everybody around it know that it's dying and there is something bad going on and they should be ready. And in some ways, it's a little bit like the interferon production with the antiviral state where we're trying to warn surrounding cells. Here, the cell is dying and is warning its neighbors of some potential issue. And so instead of having things like DNA fragmentation and the membrane stays together when we make these little blobs, um, the cell swells up really big and it explodes <laughs> um, in pyroptosis. Pyroptosis can be defined also as cell death involving caspase 1. It cuts a bunch of stuff in That makes the cell die. That makes the cell die. Um, one of the big ones is called Gasdermin D. It's been developed relatively recently. It's a big part of actually poking holes in the membrane to make the cell explode. And so a lot of NLRs will lead to inflammasome formation and can potentially lead to um, pyroptosis. A, the figure on the next slide actually has a different PRR in it. It's not an NLR, but you don't care right now. I just care about the PRR. Um, and so you, can, you might have a cell that infected by a virus, you might have a PRR signal to lead to interferon production so that that cell hey neighbors, there's a virus around, get into the antiviral state. So does not particularly want to be a virus factory making more virus particles to infect its neighbors. That cell is not going to ever become uninfected. That cell should die. And so that R can also lead to caspase 1 induction and pyroptosis of the cell. And so now we're the cell so it no longer produces other nearby cells. And so this can be a very useful form of uh, cell death for these cells. Slide is a very old slide, um, as is the next slide. Um, but these are some of the things that have been shown to be recognized by some type of NLR. So there's a huge number of NLRs. One thing that you might notice is we've got things from viruses, we've got things from bacteria, we've got things from fungi, we've got things from protists. So there probably are going to be multiple signaling pathways. That's why it's hard to sort of sum it up. There are also a lot of different um, sterile activators that seem to lead to um, NLR uh, recognition. Um, and so NLRs seem to be at the center of a lot of different disease states. In fact, if you look at human diseases um, and see, have we linked this disease to a mutation in something in the inflammasome, or does it respond 
chromosome or part of animal models, um, you can get a yes for all of these different types of diseases. So you can see, um, at this point, it's getting to the point where it's almost easier to make a list of diseases that don't have the inflammasome playing a role. And there are also some of them, like the ones listed here, where people actually have mutations in PRRs that make them overactive, where they just have random cytokine production. There are some things that are called periodic fever syndromes, where people just get random fevers because their, their PRRs start producing interferon. Um, there is actually one where people get uh, fevers when they take a shower, um, that it's, it's temperature sensitive. Um, and so we're actually finding more and more really random things that are all tied to this inflammasome process. Last group of, of PRRs, um, I will admit to you, I set up this lecture on purpose this way for, well, one reason, they were discovered last. Second reason, they're the ones I work on in the lab. And if I put them first, we would spend the whole period talking about them, um, which are the ALRs. So the ALRs um, are responding to DNA um, that can be from viruses or bacteria. Usually we're talking about viral DNA. We'll just assume viral DNA. Um, and they can be either in the cytoplasm or in the nucleus. Um, in humans, there are four different ALRs. Um, they were described because they were similar to a protein called AIM2, so it's AIM receptor. Um, all of them have this uh, domain called the pyrin domain, and they also have a DNA binding domain called the HIN200. So sometimes people call them the HIN200 proteins. Sometimes people call them the HIN because they have pyrin and HIN. Um, or sometimes you can call them uh, the ALRs. Um, and um, many of, and they, there are largely two different things we see these uh, proteins do. Some of them act in the cytoplasm and lead to a signaling cascade through IRFs and interferon production. So these are really important in sensing viral DNA and leading to interferon production. They also can be very important for viral DNA and leading to pyroptosis. And in fact, these are really the only proteins that can do both the interferon and the pyroptosis um, pathway instead of either or. Some of them are found in the cytoplasm. Some of them are even found in the nucleus. Um, and so this is sort of what we see with those aim factors. It does not fall neatly into any of the families that I'm describing to you, but the cytoplasm. And it also binds to viral DNA, just like the ALRs. And it leads to interferon, just like the ALRs. So I kind of put it here. Um, it is known as CGAS. Um, CGAS is an enzyme, and that enzyme makes a small molecule that has an AMP and a CMP put together. Cyclic GMP AMP, or CGAMP. Um, and as a result, people named the protein CGAMP. CGAMP is CGAMP synthase. Um, as it will make this small molecule that will lead to IRF, that will lead to interferon production. Um, this is actually a pretty famous and pretty uh, well-studied uh, PRR in the immune system. And work lab, but you know, really we care about the immune system. And so what you can see is that all of these different ways of testing microbes can lead to um, some type of that potentially can actually stop infection um, and completely block uh, the pathogen from further replicating. They are all part of the innate immune response. One thing that I did not mention, I slipped my mind, um, when I was telling you about some of those proteins that are the antiviral state proteins, like SAMHD1 and PKR and OAS and all that stuff, those proteins are actually also intrinsic immune proteins. 
So that's, again, one of those places where this doesn't separate too nicely. <laughs> um, and so that, those are actually part of intrinsic immunity. But the final thing that all of these cytokines do that we've been talking about is they help to turn on the adaptive immune system. And so on Friday, we start with the adaptive immune system. We will come back and talk a little bit more about the innate immune system later in the semester because of the ways that the innate and adaptive immune systems are interlinked. Um, at this point, anything else I was telling you about the innate immune system ties into the adaptive, so you gotta know the adaptive first. So we will sort of circle back a little bit um, with a couple of other things, um, but we are going to start learning about him, how immunologists learned about adaptive immunity on Friday, and I will see you in lab tomorrow.